Hello, my name is Philip Sales. I'm a High Court Judge. I'm here to talk to you about statutes or Acts of Parliament. What are they and how do lawyers use them? An Act of Parliament is also known as a statute. It's a measure passed by Parliament after being approved by the House of Commons and the House of Lords and given the Royal Assent, which is when the Queen signs it. Enacting statutes is one of the main functions of Parliament. We elect MPs to make laws in Parliament, which is our legislature. Statutes are made on the authority of the democratically elected legislature. A statute states the law and usually changes the law in some way. Statutes are the most important source of law in our legal system. A statute takes precedence over judge-made rules of law, known as the common law. When a new statute is enacted by Parliament, it can change rules of law contained in the common law or in previous statutes. So, very often, when lawyers sit down to work out what the law is, which is to be applied to resolve some problem, or when they stand up in court to argue a case, the first legal rules they will turn to are rules laid down in statutes. In studying law, it's important that you get used to referring to statutes and understand how they work. Every law student needs access to the exact text of relevant statutes. The Blackstone Statute Series provides an accurate, updated text of carefully selected statutory provisions in the main areas of law studied on university courses. Today, I'm going to talk a bit about one very important statute, the Human Rights Act 1998, to explain what a statute looks like and how to go about reading it. Lawyers often call this interpreting or construing a statute. When you first start looking at statutes, don't be put off by the formal language they use. Remember that statutes state the law in an authoritative way. The drafter tries to be precise in saying exactly what the law is, so that ordinary citizens and their lawyers can look at the statute and get a good idea of what they may and may not do. Statutes come in a fairly standardised format. They have a short title, which is the name by which they can be cited in cases and discussion. In our example, the short title is the Human Rights Act 1998. They also have a long title, which gives a rather fuller indication of what the statute is designed to achieve. And here we see uh, the long title for the Human Rights Act. The body of a statute is broken down into sections, which are the provisions which formally state the law which the statute enacts. The two key provisions in the Human Rights Act which modify the law are Section 3, which enacts a new rule of statutory interpretation, which we see here, and also Section 6, which enacts a new obligation on public authorities, and we see that here. In long statutes, sections may be grouped into different parts of a statute, dealing with different topics. An example is the Terrorism Act 2000. We can see that Part 5 groups together sections dealing with counter-terrorist powers. In some statutes, complex or more peripheral legal provisions may be put into a schedule to the Act. A section in the Act says that the schedule has effect, and the provisions in the schedule have the same force of law as other provisions in the Act. Again, the Terrorism Act 2000 provides us with an example. Statutes often contain a definition section, usually located towards the back of the Act. These are like a special dictionary of terms used in the Act to help in understanding precisely what the Act says. In the Human Rights Act, because of the importance of the concept of convention rights throughout the Act, Section 1 is the provision which defines the meaning of convention rights, as we see here. The Act also contains a more technical definition section, Section 21, which sets out definitions of other, less prominent terms used in the Act. Many statutes come to be amended by later statutes, as Parliament finds new problems with the way the law works or wants to change the regime in an Act in some way. An existing provision may be taken out and a new provision inserted in its place. 
or Parliament may add in new provisions, giving them numbers with letters. We can see some examples in the Terrorism Act 2000, section 63A, 63B and 63C. In your book of statutes, amendments to statutes added by later statutes are indicated by square brackets. An act does not become law until it receives the signature of the Queen, the Royal Assent. But even then, an act sometimes contains a provision which says that it does not come into effect until a commencement order is made later on by a government minister. When lawyers interpret an act of Parliament, they look primarily at the precise words Parliament has used in the relevant section. But they read them in the context of the whole statute so as to make the best overall sense of that section in the scheme of the Act as a whole. They also re read the words bearing in mind any indications about the general objective the Act was setting out to promote, or as it's sometimes put in more old-fashioned uh, legal language, having regard to the mischief or defect in the law which the Act was intended to remedy. An Act may itself provide clues about that, or it may be necessary to refer to the general background of the state of the law when the Act was passed, or to formal reports called White Papers, which the Government issued to explain its proposals for legislation. Statutes are also to be interpreted in the light of certain well-settled presumptions about what Parliament is usually understood to mean, even though it does not spell that out in terms in the Act which is to be interpreted. The presumptions about meaning may be overridden if Parliament makes it clear that it intends they should not apply. Some of those presumptions are contained in the Interpretation Act 1978, such as that words importing the masculine gender, like he or his, are taken to import the feminine as well, she, her. Other presumptions, such as that statutes are presumed not to have retrospective effect, are derived from settled principles stated by the judges in cases. You should also be aware that in some special situations where rules of European Union law or the Convention rights under the Human Rights Act apply, special rules of interpretation govern. The courts are required to interpret statutory provisions in a way which conforms to EU law or to the Convention rights if it is possible to do so. We've already seen Section 3.1 of the Human Rights Act and here we see it again. This is the provision which creates this special rule of interpretation in relation to statutes which operate where convention rights apply. In very difficult cases where the interpretation of a section in an Act is not clear, the final determination of the meaning to be given to that section may depend on the complex interplay of all these factors. The words of the section, the scheme of the Act, the mischief it was intended to remedy, and background presumptions and special rules of interpretation. Good luck with your studies.